everybody. I'm Eugene, and I'm going to be talking about Kotlin DSLs. Uh, it's supposed to be 42 minutes, but maybe 50. Uh, have everybody heard something about Kotlin or visited some talks about Kotlin today? Oh, that's really nice. So most of the talk will be coding live. So if you realize that you're missing a point, please go ahead and ask me at the moment if you are not understanding something that's going on my screen. And so uh, first of all, a few words about myself. I'm joining us on Twitter. I'm working at JetBrains. I'm a Kotlin user. And the nice thing is I'm not from a Kotlin team, but I'm using Kotlin for many, many years and created probably one of the first production plugins using Kotlin and JVM. I'm doing server-side development. I'm doing JetBrains toolbox. I'm using Kotlin, Java, Go, and other languages. And let's turn to DSLs. So if we take a look on Wikipedia, we would see that uh, the main specific languages, it's the meaning of the DSL acronym. And uh, these are languages which really helps to solve some problems for a given domain. And they are not that universal as general purpose languages, which are, for example, Java, C, Go, and other languages like that. And frankly, these cells can be split into two parts. The one part is the uh, specific languages, which are created to solve the specific problems, and we know them for years. This can be SQL language, this can be regexp, and so on. The problem is that those languages, it's really complicated and tricky to start using it in your build process because you need to start from scratch, you need to create the parsing, lexing, and the whole stuff. Then you need to talk to guys who are setting up builds for your project, and then you need to set it up for continuous deployment, continuous delivery, and all that stuff. This can be really complicated, but sometimes it's necessary. Probably you might take a look on JetBrains MPS if you really desire to create some, such, such a complicated language. And there is yet another and pragmatic, pragmatic way of creating languages is to use your existing language, which you are using for your project to create something you need. And examples are Fluent APIs or builders, which we tend to use in Java for years. This may help us to create something which is more readable and better understandable, which helps you to express what you need for your use case. And the nice thing, you can use existing stack for it. And this is an example of DSL. Say you're using the basic language for some reason, you may come up with such a, such a thing. In my, in my slides, all examples are valid Kotlin programs. We'll take a look how these can be created later on. So to sum up, the DSLs is something how I understand it and what I'll be presenting later. This is something which is easy to read for you, for your team. This is something where you can easily express what you need. For example, uh, let's say you need to create a graphs, a cyclic graphs for some your application, for example, in tests. And you can create a, a builder API or fluent API, and which helps you to define such graphs for your tests. And then you can share this snippet to your colleague saying, hey, this is my graph, and we can fix it and create yet another test, for example. And this is easy to express, create new graphs, and easy to understand. If you're sharing this some, to somebody, they are able to figure out what you're trying to say to them. So such DSLs are really, really nice to use for configuration. Uh, for example, a friend of mine created a really nice a Kubernetes DSL for, in Kotlin to set up the ports for Kubernetes. Templating, if you need to create some output for your client side or server side application, for logic, for user interface, and so on and so on. And let's take a look on this example first. Uh, so this is a part of HTML and say our application is generating this HTML to send it to a browser. And no matter if it's running on the back end or, or client side, the, the, we need to generate something like that all and all again. And the problem is that we need to put something which is context dependent into it, like usernames, some information, and so on. And actually, we ended up to having something like this on, on our behind, behind the curtains. And I can recall only the GSPs, which were generating some stuff like that when you take a look on the source. And by the way, anyone, anyone still recalls GSPs? Oh, <laughs> nice number of people. And this is how we use And if we have such a thing in our sources, it can be quite tricky to patch it, to include some more tags. It's really 
can be tricky be without IDE support to include the close, closing tag if you're changing it, to not to forget to quote some quotes in the right way if you have some attributes inside. And the things can be turned a little bit nicer if we have a valid program in our language. It can be any language you use. And here we can see that the, every block at least is an, the block in this language. And we make it clear that we are not forgetting to close it. We are not able to mix close, close text, for example, here. And if it is done correctly, ID and compiler are our friends. They are able to help us to make sure this is right, this is correct. For example, if, if it's done right, you may see that here you have code completion, here highlighting, your ID is able to say, hey, at that place you can say, for example, BR tag or you can build string, or you can call body from these parameters. And everything is understandable. You can navigate to implementation details and take a look for Java docs or Kotlin docs inside and figure out, is it what I, I'm trying to do or it's something else? It's really nice. And if we're talking about D cells and Kotlin, there are several things which are really, really nice. The Kotlin is open source language, we know it for years, and it's tightly typed. So if you have the third inbound closure in your program, the types of everything is known. And ID and you, everybody knows what's going on inside, what is the receiver, what is the parameters, and so on. The nice thing about Kotlin is that the syntax of language is done the way where you can create the D cells or snippets like I've shown you a few slides before, really easily. And having this sum up, we have a good ID support we have compiler which is able to check on a compilation time that the DSL is valid. And we have code completion, and we have even more. You can create the same code snippet, and you can compile it to all platforms which Kotlin is supporting. This is not only the JVM. You can reuse the same code in Android, JavaScript, and native. And even more, you can create a common module which you can compile once and reuse on every platform you have around. And of course, are learning something new, in particular learning a new language or learning new features, is way more easier if you try it. And next we'll try to create a small application which deals with uh, an existing Java part. So here I have a tiny application, it just says hello, I can start it, it even works. And here I have a number of Java, Java files. You see, you see the text, right? It's okay? okay. So here I have an modifiable pojos, serial classes. Of course, I can write it in Kotlin and serial lines, but it, it's a Java. And we will not change in this Java code. Say you have a library, your, uh, some product, some library, you cannot change, but you're going to be using it. And here I have a, a pojo. It has four fields, two string fields, two another pojos inside. So here I have two parameters. Here I have one parameter. And we have a builders. The trivial thing, the same, the same stuff with the setters and getters. So we are able, and, and the build method at the end. And uh, here we have an example. So this example, oh, uh, I'm going to close this away. Yeah. So this example builds these three objects for our domain. And now we will try to come up with a, with a nice looking D cell which shows how one can create this one. Uh, so first step for me is to just take this one and copy it to an existing Kotlin file over here. And I paste it here. And IntelliJ helps me to convert my Java code into Kotlin code. And there will be several changes. Let's do it. So the first thing I can spot is here. So in Kotlin, you're, we have a type inference, local type inference in this case. And in Kotlin, we do not need to specify types several times in one expression. Kotlin is able to figure out that the type of builder is JavaPlan builder. Of course, if we need explicit type, we can specify it this way. Uh, but of course, in most cases, we don't. The second thing is that in Kotlin, we don't need to write a new keyword. We don't have a new keyword in Kotlin. Instead, we simply say the type name, and we call constructor over here, constructor over here, and that's it. Uh, next nice thing about, is about the properties. So I'm here, I'm calling this the setter from a Java. But in Kotlin, you can consider it be a field, play like a field. It's called a property. The same thing you have, for example, in C Sharp for years. And of course, in Kotlin, if you still need it, you can say set, set 
for, you need to type it manually. First name from this is possible in Kotlin as well, so you can call the method uh, uh, from a Java. But if the method is called set something, you can use something as a, as, a, as a property. This is done automatically. You don't need changing your existing Java to have this. And this looks way better than the things before. Uh, let's now take a look how this program runs. And here we realize that we have a sort of like problem. In our data class, we have no right implementation of toString. And as I said before, we are not going to change our code. So we need to create an utility function which prints it up in a readable way, right? So for this, we create a function in Kotlin. So in Kotlin functions created with a funky word, then I, I would say print, print, uh, so client is our client, and this one returns string. In so in Kotlin, you define this this way. So uh, the parameters are specified here. You can you specify name, then the type, then return type is specified this way. And here I simply say return and say client dot Twitter dot handle. So I, I would return something meaningful, probably, maybe not. Ah, say com company and say name. Uh, the next trick in Kotlin is that if you do this one, you can shrink it to an expression body. You can do this one. So, and then Kotlin is able to infer type for you. So if you do not feel you like to specify types explicitly, you can drop it out and have it this way. Then we have a parameter uh, templates for a string and let me convert it to, well, to template. It will look a little bit better. So now we can do it like, like we used to have in Java. I guess everybody from us has a, a huge number of static classes with static functions which helps us to deal with some APIs, do we? Well, yeah, I see, I see some hands in school. Uh, but you know, this is uh, not the best thing we can do out of this. Actually, I, I would like to be able to say something really, really nice. I would like to say it this way. I would like to say client to console string. This one would look really nice and I can do it this way. So I can generate an extension function of course, in my case, I can generate a member function because the Java sources are in the same project, so I can touch it, but I don't like to do it. So I can generate an extension function in Kotlin in this, in, for this type over here, and it will return string. Uh, oh, and this is a body we don't need now. So in Kotlin, this is a, a really syntactic sugar. So what we do here, we create a, a kind of utility function, and the trick is that Kotlin allows us to call a utility function to be looking like a member call. That's it. So if you take a look on the bytecode side, you'll see that this is a static function inside, which takes the first parameter of type client. And here, as an implementation, I, I, can, I just copy-paste this one. And here, go, here goes yet another trick. So I, let's say I just say uh, this way for short. And of course, and of course, I don't have a client variable in this example. And the thing is that be it an extension function means that inside this body, I can use this keyword. And this keyword refers to an instance of this Java client type. And be it, since it's this keyword, we can avoid it, and we can have it this way. So we can just think as this one is a part of this class, but actually this is a static, static utility behind. And this is not, of course, I can do private for, for short. And we can go further a little bit and say we need it. I, I'd like I need this one. This is also possible. And this is a really nice GCL builder building block. So I want to have a field or property which does the trick for me. And I can create it really nice and easy way. I just copy this one. I say here val. So I create a readable property. And here you specify the, the name of it, and you need to implement the get function. Oh, where, where am I? Uh, and you need to implement the get function for it, and that's it. Now we can say it this way. So this is how we can beautify an existing APIs. And let's take a look further how we can benefit from it in creating these cells. So let's recall we have huge block of code over here, and we need to make it look really nicely. 
And, and the first step, the first step is to figure out that here we have a hidden knowledge. We know in this code snippet how to create a builder. And let's do the first two or things. Let's create a function which takes an object which actually builds this, in, this uh, client, Java client class. So I create a function like, like we can do it in Java. So I create a function create client which takes supplier, which takes supplier. Do you know the supplier type? Oh no, no not supplier, consumer. Do you know consumer type from Java? Okay, not enough hands, I guess. So let's take a look here. This is standard type from Java 1.8. It has one meaningful method which called accept. It's from T. So, and we pass supplier which takes Java client builder here and returns Java client. And this one does a really, really trivial thing. So it first creates client builder, then it calls accept from a supplier. So we're trying to say the supplier is one which is supposed to create the builder for us. Oh, here it's supposed to be Java client. Client builder. And now we return result, right? So this pattern can be used in Java. For example, if you're doing some, say, transaction behind the curtains, you really, really like to control the entry and the leaf and you make this, this consumer generate the data for you, say you're any anything like that. And now we can convert this code into the following, following thing. So we can say val client is create client. And here we create an anonymous object for short, which takes, which is observe, which is consumer from Java client builder. And here we implement this, the one method we need. We go here and say, implement it for me. And here we, uh, I name it builder. And I, I just copy paste the whole meaning in here. So the trick is that now I no longer need to know how the builder is created. Instead, I'm just creating, I'm just passing something which is able to build the, fun the result for me. And I no longer need this one and I no longer need that one. Uh, and this should work as well uh, as, as it used. And uh, this, by the way, this one is how one can create an anonymous class in Kotlin. There is a nice thing as you are able to specify as many types as you, as you need in here. You are not bounded with one type as we have in Java. And sometimes it allows to minimize code. But if we're trying to create some Lambda looking interface, we have a helper in Kotlin and we can convert it to Lambda. So we can simply say, I create a consumer. This is the name of the interface I'm creating. And that's it. But the good thing about Kotlin is that we have lambdas and the higher order functions in a, on a language level. So instead of passing the consumer interface, like I created it from a Java style way, you can say directly here, I need a lambda function, which takes one parameter in a, bra in a braces and this parameter returns unit. So unit in Kotlin is a type which is synonym of void in Java. So we can say, we say unit instead of void. And is B, as it is a lambda, we no longer need to call any method on it. We can call it like a, fun like a function, like a normal function. And this one, now I need to drop this one here to make it look, look this way. So this is how you can pass a lambda in Kotlin. Uh, there are several nice things. If you do not like to name the parameter, you can use name it. And once it, this is a default name, so you can omit this declaration of the parameter names. If you have a lambda which takes only one parameter, you can just avoid this. And the second trick is if in your function you accept a lambda, and this is a really nice disobeying block. If you have a lambda as a last parameter, you can move lambda outside of the braces. So it will look like this. You see that? So this is how you can use. Of course, if you have a number of parameters, you can pass it here, but we don't have, so we can simply, an IntelliJ shows me that this is not necessary. So I can do it this way. But still, we have a number of things written here, which are kind of long run. So we have it here, and 
I know the solution. What I want to do, I wanted to have it this way. So I would say just first name is this. And why should I say it on every field I try to complete? This is, this is an extra code I need to write, and I don't like it. So let's take a look on this one and on that one. So we have an extension functions uh, as we created this to console string, for example, function. Uh, and as we have an extension functions, we actually allow to create this type, use this same type of function as a lambda. So instead of saying this, I can say that. So I would say that the create client function takes a lambda with a receiver. Uh, so this is like I'm taking an extension function with, with, which is defined in place. And if I do this, I have a really nice syntax. So I can call it inside like this, like, like a function. So I'm taking an extension function. And as it is an extension function, I, I call it this way, like an extension function, like we did it with a console string over here. The same thing. But it changes nicely the, the thing of what is going on inside create client. So now I have this inside create client, which is pointing to this Java client builder class. And as it does this keyword, I can avoid it to have it this way. Is it clear now? OK. OK. So now we can simplify things. And we can drop this away, drop that away, and drop that away. Well, it's not the end, since we have a really complicated part over here. And we need to get rid of this. And the first thing is that we hardcore these several additional builders. And there is no reason to do that, since we, say, we said we're going to create a client. So all builders are supposed to be defined somehow. right? And this one can be done in a following way. I can create a function, which is actually an extension function for Java client builder, and it's called, say, Twitter. And this function takes a builder. I, I'll be copy pasting code. It's easier. Uh, so it takes Twitter builder. And this function does the following. It says, I would write this way, Twitter is equal to uh, Java Twitter builder apply as build. Tricky. And let me explain. Let create this function. Uh, let create this apply function for us. So of course, first step we can avoid this one. I hope it's clear now, because this is an extension function and this keyword can be optional. And now the apply function. The apply function is from a Kotlin standard library. Let's take a look. If we, it's quite. It, I, th I think it's understandable. So this is an extension function, which is extension, for the, which is itself generic. So it's extension function for every type t, and it takes the block. It turns the block and it turns itself back, right? So if I, I can copy it, let's 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 do let's inline types to take a look to make it a little bit more understandable. So instead of t, I have this one. Uh, I have I have this one. I supposed to be copy pasting this one. I have it. Uh, do I have? Oh, okay. So we can take this one, put it over here, and then we have type T, which is, which is again the Java client builder and so on. So, and the second thing, if you have a type of lambda in your function, of course you can pass the, f the lambda in the next function just directly without having anything specific inside. Um, so this is how I can create this. And since I have this Twitter here, I can simplify this block and I can replace this one with the following short part of, of the code. Uh, I should be, yeah. Is it better? Well, I think so. Uh, similarly, we can fix the second one. And let's see, let's just copy paste this, this code snippet. And of course, we don't need to declare this apply function explicitly since it's in the standard library. It really helps us doing things. And I'm going to have a company builder. Uh, so I pass company builder here. I say company. I say company, company here. And of course, I need a company builder instance over here. And it calls company. 
And now I can drop this whole thing and replace it with a shiny looking lambdas. And I do, well, I do this one. And I can drop this away. So as, as a result, we started from the really nice looking Java builder quite long, quite explicit, understandable. Everybody can read this and understand what's going on inside. And we ended up having the same exactly thing looking this way. Well, if we, for example, talking about the readability, you can share this to anybody from your team saying, hey, I'm creating this object and here's how I do it. This resembles me the things like JSON, for example, when you create a Podjo, you, you can see and understand what's going on inside. And the actual thing is, I have not changed anything as you see it from this one. I have not changed anything from my Java sources. So be it the sources, be it the library, the things will play the same way. And the main, and the main trick when you're building DSLs is that you can use this Lambda with a receiver and you can simplify things and turn it into things like that. Of course, you can do some more operator overloading stuff and more other stuff. It's, it's really nice and you can take a look on examples I have. So uh, if, there is a th if there is no some questions, I'm gonna switch to the presentation back. Is it okay? Okay. So um, when you start creating your DSLs, you, may, you, you, need to, you need documentation, you need to understand the language, you need to understand how you uh, what you can do out of this language. And there are several keywords, you can Google it, and I'll upload my presentation so you can just click on the links. And this is extension functions, this is lambdas, and there is a really, really nice article, types of builders in the Kotlin documentation site. This shows how you, explains how you can create the details like we show, we, we've seen before. And if we now take a look on the example I had a few slides before, this is the same HTML we're trying to generate, and now we see the DSL sample as I shown. Now I hope you're able to understand how you can create such a DSL from scratch. It's, it should be not that complicated. You create a function called HTML, which takes a lambda with a receiver. Then you create a function head, which takes another lambda with a receiver on the other type, and so on and so on. And then you have this one. And the plus here, you see that, for example, plus hello or plus this is, this is a most, this plus is an overloaded operator, so we overload the plus to make it possible to pass the string into our builder. We need to call some function, we, we can call it line, we can call it print line, we can call it somehow, or we can use the operator to simplify the verboseness of this example. And the, this code snippet was from the existing library, it's called kotlinx.html, you can find out it on a GitHub. This existing library can use it, you can use it for JavaScript, JVM backends, it's cross-platform Kotlin library, pure Kotlin code. And uh, as a wrap-up, I have a really nice example. Uh, this is a code snippet from Guava libraries, it's in Java. And when you see this guarded by annotation, it's really nice. If you're trying to have a contract in your code, you're saying that, okay, I have these two fields, which is supposed to be accessed only with a lock being held, but it's really tricky to make sure that in your code base during the evolution, this is not changed. And to solve this, you may have some static code checks, you may do code reviews, you can do whatever you like, but this is really a nice example how we can use Kotlin to solve it the other way. And say we just extract this state to a dedicated object, and I have two properties here, declared this way. Kotlin is able to infer types for us, so it's getting easier. You don't need to specify types explicitly in this case. And then we create what we need to do. We need to create this class guarded by, as shown on the first line. And the ideal usage of this state is to say, hey, I need to use this state. Let it help necessary logs for me, but I don't want to specify those logs explicitly. So we create the function we, we use the, we call guarded, pass the lambda with the receiver inside, the receiver is of type state, and inside this block you can modify state. But you cannot do this outside of this. And the implementation is really straightforward. 
all you need to do, you need to create a reload operator. So in Kotlin, you can define operator. So the guarded is the variable name in this slide. And to allow an allow lambda on a variable name, you define the function called invoke, and you use a specific keyword operator to let Kotlin understand that you are going to create an operator. And then we use the same pattern as I've shown you during the live coding stuff. So, but we use a generic here to make it more handy. Say you modify the state and you want to return something as a result. And the nice thing, this is lock with lock. This is a standard function from a Kotlin library. It takes lock, calls the action, and then it, it, undo, undo, it, it unlocks it. That's, that's so easy. And on the, on the declaration, you may see the default parameters in Kotlin. For every function, you may specify default values. In my case, the lock variable in a constructor of the class is specified with a default value rent and lock. So if you have specific lock, you may pass it. If you don't, you can simply say guarded by from state, the first line, and that's it enough. This is enough. And we don't use new keyword in Kotlin. We can simply say type name and the parameters for a constructor. And this is how you can benefit from a DSLs or trivial DSLs for your daily life. For it's quite easy, I guess. And it's and then you don't need to do static checks because you're able to make a compiler do the static checks for you. So you don't need extra step for your build steps in this case. And of course, during this presentation, there were several things which I forgot. And uh, you may see, the, for example, the long name for a function. In Kotlin, you can say, you can easily say something like, I, can, I, think, I think I'm not forgetting this. So you can say, for example, um, create the client. And now I rename my function. So I use this um, quotes, the, the reverse quotes, create the client. Uh, so you can define the function this way. And then you can, if you're doing a D cell the, that can add more sense to a D cell, if you somewhere here, you can create, say something, not the company, but say something long. Or if you, for example, doing the unit tests with unit four, it works pretty well. You can name your test with spaces inside, run it, and you'll see the long names in the test runner. It works in IntelliJ, it works with Gradle. This is nothing to do. And, uh, you can also overload the number of operators, not only plus, but the standard operators you expect from C-like languages, like you have in a Java. You can even uh, overload the operator invoke, as I shown before, to pass lambda or something. And you can uh, overload the operator for indexer access, like this one. Uh, this is really nice. This can help you build in a D cells or really easy to access getters or something. And there are several things uh, which are really nice, uh, called the delegated properties and delegated implementations. In Kotlin, you can say you have a property which is set x by lazy. So if you specify an object with a dedicated get value and set value, or only get value for unmodifiable properties, then you can specify something inside. For example, this one creates, the first one creates an x, and the lambda, initialized lambda, is executed only once when you're first trying to code. It's really nice. The second one is a delegated implementation. So if you have an interface with 100 methods, you don't need to do a call of this interface if you're trying to delegate it. Instead, you can use this by syntax. So you can say object A implements B, and the B interface is implemented from a C, which is instance of C. It, re it minimizes the code you need and helps, for example, building D cells as well. And if we uh, start thinking about this, there are several more keywords I would really like to share. This is delegated properties, operator reloading, and of course, types of builders. This is a really nice thing. And if we uh, take a look on how these cells are being built, I would say this is an iterative process. So you start with a, a D cell you want to have, then you try typing it, then you may use IntelliJ to create the functions, operators, and anything, so just trying to make something, not, something that is compilable. Then you realize what you have, and then you may repeat. So for example, you may start doing something, you have this one, and then you create it, 
return and realize if it's no go or go. And here we have an infix function call, so the print input and go to are infix functions, which takes int from the left side and something from the right side. So infix keyword, when you declare a function, helps doing this one. And I, I think, yeah, we have, have several moments to take a look on this. Uh, so if we go here, we see that the, the trick is done this way. So you can say infix function, which takes in from the left side, the number of line, and the string from the right side. That's it. And if we, let's see. Similarly, you can think what is unthinkable. And this is, I hope nobody will use it. But this is a valid cons Kotlin thing. You can do it if you, if you need it for some reason. But I hope you'll reiterate building your DSL further and realize that it's not, not the best thing to do. And talking about DSLs and doing DSLs is really nice. And of course, there are a huge number of DSLs which are here. And of course, Kotlin standard library contains a really, really nice tiny micro DSLs like also apply and so on. Also, we have a Kotlin coroutines and Kotlin X coroutines library. Uh, this whole thing is built on a D cells on a function with the receivers. It's really nice taking a look on it. And there are other D cells like, for example, this one. Here we're trying to do a data binding. binding. And the idea was to try playing with them. XPath looking expressions. But the idea was not to quote these expressions, but have a Kotlin language implementing this expression. So in this case, the division is the operator, which is overloaded, and so on. So you can write like an expression, and you can have custom functions. You can have anything you like. And this is a valid Kotlin code. There is Gradle script Kotlin. This is really nice. Uh, when you are able to write your Gradle scripts in a, in a Kotlin language. In this case, IntelliJ and other IDEs is able to understand what you have inside your closures what type is the receiver, what, what properties you can use, what functions, what methods are there. It's really nice. And then it works better because you are not able to do a trivial mistakes. And a Groovy, for me, it was like possible. It's quite easy to forget something. Uh, there is a DSL in TeamCity. By the way, who is using TeamCity? OK. So, but the nice thing about that is that it's able to generate a DSL for you. So, if you have a configurations, you build plans, then you can click and say, hey, I need a DSL out of this. And it generates a DSL for you. And then you can start relating on DSL, making it more specific for your build plans. It's really nice. And Spring Framework, I hope you've been listening to a talk, the previous slot, about the, how Spring works with Kotlin. It's really nice. And there are nice DSLs inside, which helps you doing your stuff. Um, if you're doing a BDD testing, there is a really nice spec library which helps you to define with a DSL-like on the right part of the, my slide. You can use DSL-like stuff to define things like this one and define your BDD specification test. And of course, there are more. There are way more examples. And you may follow these links. You may create your own. If you create, share it. It's really nice to take a look what people can do. And there is a really nice thing to start with. You can use try.kotlinlang.org. There you can type your Kotlin code just in browser. You can check, or you can solve a tiny tasks like a Kotlin coans. This is a really, really nice thing if you want to try Kotlin, if you want to learn things inside a language. And there is Kotlin Slack if you want to ask questions, if you want to communicate. As far as last time I checked, it was 20 or 12,000 people in there, maybe more. So. Join, join the, this and ask questions or read answers if you like it. And so I was expecting it to complete in 42 minutes. So we have a few, few moments to discuss questions. So OK, one more trick for the end. Um, uh, if we take a look on our D cell we've created, it's nice it, that it fits a tweet. So <laughs> we can tweet it. So it fits 280 characters. So I, I tweeted with a, with a photo from a stage.
Yep. Thank you.